This is our 35th lesson on the biblical flood. I'm Marion Fox, the instructor. We're using my book. We're using the second edition of my uh, the book, The Biblical Flood. And uh, it has not yet been printed yet. So we're still, I'm still working on it. Okay? It's a work in progress. Welcome to the class. We're looking at concurrent factors affecting the Earth during the flood. Now, of course, my flood model has a planet uh, causing uh, a large portion of the flood. The bulk of the flood was caused in my flood model by tidal action from the uh, planet. Now, we're going to name the planet and give evidence for it tonight. Large amounts of water moving from the ocean basins due to tidal action over the surface of the land would, of course, depress the continents. That weight of that water would push the continents down into the magma. And this would force other parts of the Earth, both the ocean basins and the continents, to be elevated from Pascal's law. Because a, on a closed fluid, like in a, a, a hydraulic jack, for example, hydraulic system, hydraulic brakes and so forth, uh, from Pascal's law, we looked at that last week. We'll not go back and review it. But what would happen is that force would be uh, distributed throughout. Now, if there were breaks in the crust, we might have volcanic action to come out. Part of the magma comes out due to the pressure. This would also form cracks throughout the earth, the plates as the crust lifted, elevated, and then lowered in various places. And of course, we have, uh, we have, uh, we'll see later, the uh, rotation of the earth was speed, I believe, was changed. The day was shortened, uh, lengthened, that is, I'm sorry, it's, the earth slowed down its rotation. And uh, this would, of course, uh, have to form a new diameter at the equator because of the lowered forces. So we form cracks in, in, in of course, plates. And the uh, planet being at different locations relative to those plates would cause them to move in different directions. The amounts of ice was deposited from the ice rings of the planet to cause the flood would depress the continents into the magma. That is, the, uh, the continents that had ice on them. This would force other parts of the Earth, both the ocean basin and the continents, to be elevated by Pascal's law again. And of course, would form cracks throughout the Earth whenever this occurred. So we have two forces uh, acting in, as downward weights uh, on the continents. It will be the water and then the ice. And of course, uh, both of these uh, would be a uh, large amount of weight. Now, if you look at the ocean basins we see right here, we see uh, the basins here as, uh, as they would be elevated when the water come out and overflowed the land. And of course, ice being deposited like up in this area here in North America. And of course, what would happen is this weight up here on the top of the continent uh, as we see on the top of the map here, that is, it would push downward on that continent. And of course, the continent sets on a, like a tooth, on a, like a rut on a tooth, on a human tooth, and it's called a craton, C-R-A-T-O-N. And this would cause the southern part of the continent to lift upward in ele elevation as it tilted and tilted in that direction, like like in a boat, if you step in the back of a boat, the front of the boat will tilt upward. Same pr same process, same principle. And uh, so what we do is we would have this added weight. And of course, we would also have the weight of the water as it w went across, probably balancing out during the flood. But as the water moved off and the ice remained, the continent would, stay, it would be tilted. Uh, lowered on the northern end here, that is North American continent, and raised on the southern end of the continent. Okay. Now, what we see here is uh, with this, this added weight would would elevate the basins of the oceans as well, because the weight coming off them, the forces would lift them upward. 
and of course depress the continents in the process and the magma then would act like a fluid and uh, then of course we'd have Pascal's law uh, in effect. Okay. Hydraulic jack. Concurrent factors any twisting action brought about by the interaction of the magnetic fields of the Earth and the planet would cause the flood would twist the crust of the Earth upon the planet. However, these forces would not be very large, but they would uh, be some forces, but they wouldn't be major. Magnetic field interaction might also cause localized magnetic moment reversals, and we'll show that in just a few minutes how that would have occurred. Now, as we take the planet, E is for the Earth and P is for the planet that caused the flood. And I'm convinced it was the planet Mercury, but we'll get to that later in this lesson. The magnetic field of the planet would uh, the North Pole geographic pole is the South magnetic and the South geographic is a North magnetic pole. And of course, the compass points that way. The North Pole on the compass points toward the North geographic pole which opposites attract in magnetics, and so that makes it have to be a south magnetic. Of course, that, that's pretty simple physics. But the planet, if it had its pole, its south pole, south magnetic, and on the top of it, these uh, magnetic fields would go like this, and they would go through the crust of the Earth like this, going through it as the planet moved. And of course, then this would cause this this North Pole would be here moving in that direction. So we'd have the pole of the magnetic fields. If the crust was moving and, uh, and of course, uh, molten rock was uh, forming and being cooled by the water and so forth, then this could leave a magnetic field, uh, remanent, they call it remanent fields, uh, in, the, in the rocks themselves. And this is one of the things that they get into. As the planet moved down, then this North Pole would be going in this direction up here to the South Magnetic Pole up here. And again, this would uh, affect what we see in the rocks due to this action. Now, one of the things that they use to date the Earth is, of course, uh, they use magnetic fields and they say there have been a reversal of the fields. And of course, uh, if this is true, uh, they, of course, extrapolate back in time and they use, uh, of course, they resort back to uniformitarian geology to do this. <laughs> OK, but what they've already given up uniformitarian geology. I warned you that they would do this uh, in the very first two or three lessons. We warned you of this. This is a problem. They're not consistent that as a geologist or not. So they they take these. Uh, layers of rock and they figure out so many million years for each of these layers and they've rejected the catastrophic view which of course uh, reversing of the magnetic polarity your normal polarity and they reverse it and of course i believe this could have reversed uh, in uh, in of course uh, the planetary action the magnetic field of the planet now our magnetic north pole is not lined up with the geographic North Pole. This, of course, is magnetic north, but the, the magnet points to north is what they mean by that. And so it's really a south magnetic pole up here that it lines up with. Of course, it's called declination and it's not lined up. Now, I'm in Oklahoma City right now, and Oklahoma City is pretty close to lined up with the north geographic magnetic pole, that is. It's off by just a degree or two. But Tulsa, Oklahoma is pretty well lined up with it, about uh, roughly uh, nearly 100 miles east of us. And of course, if you go further west, it gets off more. If you go further east, it gets off. So it doesn't line up with true north. The magnetic compasses have to be adjusted, called declination, but we won't spend more time on that. But that's a problem for the models of how the magnetic field should have been created. Here is their C4 split spreading as they talk about it. And I, I do believe that there is evidence that spreading is occurring, but the spreading began during the flood 
and it was created by the planetary action and the gravitational action and the change in the rotational speed of the Earth, all of these factors in it. And uh, so the oceanic crust. And so they have the, the magnetic anomalies. Anomaly is a, a Greek alpha primitive and the word nomos, nomos or law. So there's, it's not following the law that you'd expect or what you would expect is what that means. <clears throat> so that's what they're saying here. Now let we look further at this. The gravitational field of the planet caused a flood attracting the equatorial bulbs uh, of the Earth would change the position of the equator. Now the gravitational field, because the Earth bulges, would have a greater force upon that bulge and tend to twist the Earth. Because the core of the Earth would be round, it would not be greatly affected by the differences in the gravitational attraction of the planet that caused the flood. So the, the forces would be upon the crust of the Earth, which would tend to move it in different positions. And of course, if the Earth slowed down on its rotational speed, then that crust would have to shrink. And of course, uh, it's going to bulge forming mountain ranges as well as the gravity helping to pull the mountain ranges up. So these are all factors in it. Now, we see how the forces operate, and I've, I've made it bulge a little larger than, than uh, it actually does and for em emphasis purpose, in fact, to emphasize it. The gravity pulls on this, and it creates a downward force a force, a vector force coming down in this direction. And of course, the Earth then twists on its axis. So it rotates, and as it forms a new equator, it's going to have to, the material is going to have to go somewhere. And of course, it'll, it'll like folds in a, in a scatter rug, a throw rug. If you step on it, it can roll up and fold up. And that's the kind of action that we see here occurring. The core of the Earth, we'll get, we'll get to this later. This is amazing. It's traveling, it's rotating faster than the, than the Earth itself and the rest of the Earth, which uh, really should not occur unless there's something that's happened. And that's not, uh, that wouldn't be according to what we'd expect to see. So what we find here is this is not, is not lined up with the rest of the Earth either. So they're out of they're out of sorts here. They don't rotate. It rotates around in a, in a rotation like this, and that's of course that could create earthquakes and other problems that we see here. Now glaciers. We talked about isostasy, and the Greek word isos is the word same or equal, and stasis is to stand. So it stands equal. That's what all that means. That's from a, a Greek word to stand equal. Glaciers. Now what we have here is we have glaciers and uh, ice caps. The weight of the ice, it has weight. It pushes down on the surface of the earth and makes it uh, sub subside or go downward. And of course that will uplift uh, on the other sides of it. And so we'll see that occur. Now when the ice melts and runs off, this tends to uplift and rebound. So, and of course, this rebounding doesn't occur instantly. It takes time for it to occur because the magma is uh, is a fluid, yes, but it's a pretty sticky fluid, a pretty dense fluid. It doesn't move. And of course, it has a lot of mass, which takes a while for it to move and uh, get movement. So what, what happens is we get the glacial rebound as the glacier melts. And it tends to rebound. And that, of course, is going to shift the continents. Here's a map of North America. This is Canada here in the United States here. This is the state of Florida up here. This will be in Newfoundland. And, and this uh, in this region up here. And here's the Great Lakes of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico down here. But here's Hudson's Bay. Hudson's Bay, I've flown over it twice uh, in my life. But uh, whenever we see it here, in the last 6,000 years, they claim that uh, it has actually risen 120 meters, parts of it have. So it is still rising. And of course, that weight of that ice then goes off in this 
north end of the continent uplifts, is rising, and the southern end is going down. It's actually going down, tilting into the ocean. So part of the rise of the sea might be the tilt of the continents. So keep kind of keep that in mind. These colors here tell you how much it's uh, it's risen, and uh, this red is uh, in meters. And there's 120 meters of Hudson's Bay right in Hudson's Bay. Eventually, Hudson's Bay will be dry land as if this continues, as this rebound is continuing. And uh, we're seeing evidence of that in other parts of the world where glaciers have melted. And so the mantle of the glacial ice move pushes downward. And of course, the magma, the force on this magma pushes to the side like hydraulic fluid. And it uh, then uh, it push puts pressure at other places on the crust. And of course, if there's a crack, magma can come out in the volcanic action. So the mantle then moves and it starts to move upward. It's moving, pushing downward due to the ice, and as the ice melts, it tends to move upward to, re, to readjust the isostasis to get everything the same, the forces. Here's crustal motions in millimeters per year, and uh, this is the Earth, the theory on the Earth about how this occurs, and I, I, I believe there's good physics to support this. <clears throat> but you can see by the colors, these, this pageant over here will say how much it's risen. This will be millimeters, It'll be 18 millimeters. That's per year. That's pretty much a good amount of rise right in this region right here. That's around Hudson's Bay right there in northern Canada. So we see a lot of it over in even in Europe and Scandinavian countries. Norway has had They've had to move some of their piers because they rose above water due to this action. Some places in Norway, this is back to isostatic rebound in North America since year 6,000 years BP is before present. And these contours are in meters. So this is a 70 meter line right here, rise. That line there is. This would be 80 meter line right here and so forth. So they lay them all out. Now, we see this goes way down into the United States. We see right here, this is the Great Lakes, uh, Lake Michigan here, Lake Erie down here. So these, uh, these go into the United States and to Southern Canada, but most of this is in Canada, okay? Now here's uh, Europe and this would be Ireland Northern Ireland, Ireland, this is Scotland and Wales and England, Great Britain and Northern and Ireland, these two parts. This green color is rising, it's rising. Of course, there's been ice there in the past and it's, the land is rising. And the kind of orange color, the peach color, I would call it, it's stable. It's not, not, uh, not moving one way or the other. And then the other end of it, this end rises and this, this sinks over here. So this is sinking. So the northern part of Great Britain, the island of, of England, if you want to call it that, is actually rising except for the stable part here and the stable part here. And the northern end is rising, it's green, and the southern end is kind of a, a purple color, brownish purple, and it is sinking or lowering. And again, this is happening. It can be it's being measured right now with this precise instruments. They can see this. Uh, glacial subsidence, subsidence, and uh, it it sinks, and then it rebounds when the water melts. And this course is occurring in Canada and northern Canada and Scandinavia. And so this is they actually are able to measure it. This is the depths, the top topography of the Earth. The topos is, is the word land or a region, a place, and in Greek, and graphae is the writing or a drawing. So what we have here with this, we have uh, the depths of this, 
and it's it's here and this will be mountainous areas high, high elevations here up here it's, it's ice here as this ice melts and greenland will rise above the water and it'll become more elevated and uh, so that will lower some other places with this rise that be lowering somewhere else perhaps in the ocean view there may not be they they figure the ice melts it's going to raise the oceans but at some point there has to be equilibrium to occur and the water going into the oceans will cause them to sink into the magma deeper because they added weight so it's not all you can't just figure how many cubic feet of ice actually melts and then put that in the oceans and cause them to rise because they will they will tend to uh, uh, the water will tend to weight down the map of the ocean basins over them the isostatic rebound theory has been questioned by a man named Richard Guy. Here's a link to his uh, article questioning it. And he does make some arguments and uh, they need to be dealt with. I, I think he's wrong. I think there's good. He claims the Earth is expanding. That this gives the appearance of isostatic rebound. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can look at things and uh, you're looking at an effect and it might be an appearance. It might be caused by more than one cause. And so uh, that, that of course could occur. Uh, however, I think isostatic rebound is based on good physics. And so I'm going to stay with the view that the isostatic rebound has been occurring. We well, want to look at volcanoes and I believe, of course, this would create volcanoes during the flood when all this occurs to release the magma as it found gaps in and uh, places where they could be vented or move up, up above the land and of course volcanic action i believe there was strong evidence for uh, and quite a lot of volcanic activity during the flood the level of the ozone layer o3 of course that's three oxygen molecules is thought to be diminished by halogen gases from volcanoes. Now, of course, halogen is uh, some di some different kinds of elements. Chlorine is one of your halogen elements. Okay. Large amounts of halogen gases, gases which act as catalysts to break down the ozone molecule and the eruptions of volcanoes. Now, several years ago, they got all excited about the ozone layer and then uh, once uh, a certain company got uh, got a new patent on uh, refrigerant, they just quit talking about it. But the patent was running out on the old refrigerant and they couldn't could keep manufacturing it. Anybody could manufacture it once the patent ran out. And so they had to have a new refrigerant to replace it when they got it. Just so happened that this is when they became illegal to sell it. They, they, I think it was Dow Chemical that had that patent. And it's very interesting how that occurred. And now they don't talk about the ozone layer anymore. You don't hear about it and talk about it. And so they quit talking about it. But large amounts of halogen gases, and, and chlorine is one of the gases we're talking about, break down the ozone molecule and are in the eruption of volcanoes. Here's the mesosphere, 50 to 85 kilometers. A kilometer is about six tenths of a mile. So you kind of multiply this by 0.6 and you'll get miles. That'd be pretty close. Well, we have the ozone layer about 17 to 50 kilometers up. And uh, the troposphere is from about nine to 17 kilometers, from 10 up to 17, I believe. And then we have the atmosphere below it with most of your clouds about 10 kilometers down where they occur. Now, the ozone does protect us. We have two kinds of ultraviolet light, UVA and UVB. And uh, so what we have to do is this UVB is, is more uh, destructive. The ozone layer does block it pretty good. UVB is is pretty uh, 
deadly. It's it's bad on DNA. Now here's a graph for it. We won't spend any time on it. You can study the graph and if you want to do this further, but it it shows how UV light affects DNA. And uh, so the wavelength of your light, the shorter the wavelength, the longer shorter wavelength, is the more energy it has. So a 280 nanometer, a nano is a billionth of a meter, and 280 nanometer wavelength is is pretty pretty potent stuff, and it uh, it has a pretty good uh, uh, negative effect on DNA. And so the solar flux here. And of course, 320 nanometer is is not as destructive to DNA. Okay, so that's what they're talking about. And uh, that all UV light isn't necessarily bad for you. Some UV light helps us to make vitamin D. But if you go back, the UVA is is uh, going to help us make vitamin D, and this it gets through the ozone layer pretty good. Volcanoes emit large quantities of chlorine into the atmosphere, although the amounts injected in the stratosphere are apparently much smaller. The total mass of chlorine in the ambient stratosphere is about 0.5 metric um, million tons. That would be metric tons of uh, a major volcanic eruption would, would inject 0.5 to 5 of chlorine into the upper atmosphere. So that's uh, that's a major factor in way, way beyond what we were releasing with our gases uh, from Freon gases. Now, I was teaching a taught for several years uh, an applied physics course, and I did teach general physics as well uh, a few times at, at college. And what we did is we calculated the, the mass of the uh, the uh, molecule of the gas that they were using for refrigerant freon the freon gas and uh, molecule and it was like like 60 times the, the mass of, of the uh, of a, 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 an air molecule general air molecule it's so heavy it wouldn't we would have a hard time getting in the upper atmosphere they probably set up uh, experiments where they just injected it in with freon and see what it would do. And then they claim here that it's bad for us. And I think there's probably some hanky panky going on there, in my judgment, because the molecule is just way too massive to get up into the upper atmosphere. Let's go back to this. If most of the emitted chlorine remain in the stratosphere, chlorine concentration would increase by two to 10 times the sphere global O2 depletions. Of course, uh, you can't do anything about volcanoes. They're going to occur. These volcanoes are a post-diluvian phenomenon. And I believe there would be any evidence of volcanoes before the flood. They would not be that source to deplete the ozone layer if one existed in the antediluvian world. I'm not even certain it existed, but it certainly may have. Now, let's go to the planet. We've dealt with the ozone layer. As a factor, it does help protect us from uh, DNA uh, deterioration or uh, causes of mutations you know, to our DNA. Mercury, the, the planet Mercury, I believe, was the planet that was involved in causing the flood. Mercury has a strong magnetic field, which uh, they didn't believe it should have had, but we'll get to that later. Mercury has fault zones, which they've not discovered with some of their recent probes. The orbit of Mercy ha Mercury has a high degree of eccentricity. Uh, eccentricity means it's, uh, it's not round. And so it's perihelion, and that's where it's closest to the Earth, is only it's closest to the sun, I'm sorry. Perihelion, helios is the word sun in Greek, perihelion. Is the closest to the sun is uh, 55 million kilometers, whereas its aphelion and apo is from, and so its greatest distance from the sun, aphelion is 84 million kilometers. That's pretty high eccentricity. 
The formula for eccentricity E is uh, E is uh, D sub A minus D sub P uh, quantity divided by D sub A plus D sub P, where D sub A is the uh, distance of the aphelion and D sub P is the distance of the perihelion. Which with these figures we got, we put, we can put into the equation and get the value here. So it has a high degree of eccentricity, and that's uh, I believe significant in my model. The surface topography of the Mercury and the Moon are very similar, according to Burge's page 127. He has pictures of it as well. The orbit of Mercury is presently inclined seven degrees with the ecliptic plane. Remember, the ecliptic plane is an imaginary line drawn from the center of the sun to the center of the Earth. So it's above it, it's above it, and sometimes it's below the Earth. So it's uh, in, a, in a, an orbit that's seven degrees. Now, Mercury's inclination was probably reduced by the encounter with the Earth's moon system, and I believe Venus was involved in it. We'll get to that in the latter portion of this lesson. Now, Mercury's rotation is direct about an axis exactly at right angles to the plane of its orbit. It takes 58.65 Earth days to rotate. Now, we had 150 days of breaking up of the mountains of the deep. If the planet that caused the flood, and I believe it to be Mercury, uh, came near the Earth, it would almost certainly have uh, locked in step with the Earth. And so it would have kept the same side to the Earth at all times. And as it rotated around, this would be about 50 days for each of them. But there's another action that would have changed the speed of the rotation of Mercury. We're going to get to that in a minute. But this is approximately what we see with three rotations around the Earth, three layers of rings of uh, impact craters, and, and the the model would, would have about 50 days for each cycle. So 150 days breaking up of the fountains of the deep. Remember. The rotation being at right angles to the plane of the orbit would easily be explained if its magnetic field interacted with the Earth's magnetic field of both planets rotated to conserve angular momentum. So we'd see a rotation to conserve angular momentum. And uh, that's, of course, good physics as well. That would occur. Let's look here. We see the planet Mercury coming in as it uh, interacts with uh, Mercury's magnetic fields. Now, as the planet moves down, the magnetic field, uh, of course, goes back up through the Earth. And of course, any molten rock is being magnetized at that point by this field. Magnetic dipole is tilted about 4.5 degrees on, on the planet, on Mercury. Prior to 1974, it was thought that Mercury could not have a magnetic field because it rotates too slowly and it's small. It's too small and it rotates slowly and should not have a field from the dynamo theory, the dynamo theory being the, the present theory as to how the uh, magnetic field occurs. Millions of years old too. And so that's another problem with them. Their age, if their age is wrong, it could still have the dynamo theory working. If Mercury kept the same side facing the Earth during 150 days of, of, of the breaking up of the fountains of the deep, and the winds of heaven, we would expect Mercury to have a gravitational anomaly, like a bulge, like we see on the moon. The side of the moon facing the Earth kind of bulges toward the Earth. So the, the Earth's gravity is tugging on it, and it creates a bulge and an uplift in it on that side. And we, should, we would expect to see this on Mercury as well if it also rotated around the Earth. And of course, the concentration of angular momentum would have caused the uh, smaller body to have rotated with the Earth and kept the same side most likely from it. The messenger probe, that is NASA probe, now there have been other probes by other nations, Russians particularly, and the Europeans, found two gravitational anomalies that were located 20 degrees north of the equator and about 25 degrees east and 55 degrees north and 175 east. And so there's two anomalies and bulges, basically what we call them, uh, in, uh, in 2008 is what discovered was probes. 
telescopes. One of Mercury's gravitational anomalies was probably formed by the encounter with the Earth during the flood. That's what I would argue. That makes uh, pretty good sense. The other gravitational Mercury's gravitational anomalies was probably formed by its encounter with the planet Venus shortly after the end of the flood. But on the next three slides, we'll show how that occurred. Let me give you a little background for this. As Mercury came in, coming in, it's being pulled by the Earth and it rotates around the Earth three passes. Each time the sun is tugging on it. And uh, what we have is, as it rotates three times around and finally the third time it's pulled away by the sun. Now here's, here's what I believe happened. As it rotates around, it continues and it goes, and of course the magnetic field of the sun is interacting as well with it. Yes, I believe, of course, it travels faster than the sun and its year is shorter. So Venus interacted with it and the gravity of Venus then helped the sun pull this planet that is Mercury away from the Earth in uh, in the in its orbiting. Now this orbiting, of course, uh, as it went around, it went around Venus, and of course the sun is pulling on it too. And so as it went around Venus, it made a close encounter with Venus and lost probably the last of its rings. And when it did, Venus now rotates backwards very slowly, it rotates backwards very slowly. And so this would have created a, a gravitational anomaly as it went around Venus. This is uh, called a slingshot effect. It's used by NASA in some of the probes, NASA probes, okay. So Venus pulled it, went around Venus, then it slowed down Venus uh, caused it to lose some of its speed. Some of its speed was transferred into retrograde, or re reversing the rotation of Venus. Venus might have had its uh, far side locked in phase, locked in step with the sun at this time. And uh, when it went around, it caused Venus to begin to rotate backwards. Ro retrograde is called. Your planets uh, we see here, these are the inner four inner planets. They're called terrestrial planets. There's Sun, there's Mercury and Venus and then Earth and then Mars. These are the relative sizes of the planets. Earth is the largest of the four, Venus second and Mars and then Mercury in that order. Now, what we see here, let's look at the meteorite impact orbits. There are, there's a, group of meteorites that come in at about the same time every year. And uh, these meteorites could be remnants of the, of the uh, planet, of the rings of the planet that uh, weren't pulled in with Mercury itself because they were pulled away. And so they stayed in orbit around the Earth. And uh, so these meteorites, some of that, the asteroids that we see probably are remnants of the rings of the planet. Now right here, we get our terrestrial planets, that's the inner planets. Then we come to the Jovian planets. We have the first two Jovian planets, and that's Jupiter, and I believe Jove is one of the names, the Latin names for Jupiter, the, the god Jupiter, and Saturn, and Uranus, and Neptune, and then of course Pluto. Pluto is, has been declared not to be a planet anymore. It's all definition. The, the, it still is out there rotating. Just, just they don't call it a planet anymore. But we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and then Pluto. Pluto has a very high uh, tilt on its axis. It doesn't go pretty very, very close. It's, it's off from the ecliptic plane quite a bit. So its axis is tilting pretty good pretty good tilt in its axis. Normally these planets should follow the ecliptic plane. The antediluvian orbit of Mercury was probably tilted above the ecliptic plane just like that of Pluto, as we saw in that prior slide. 
Gravitational influences of the sun, the earth, the moon, and Venus tended to move the orbit of Mercury closer to the ecliptic plane because these forces would tug on it and continue to tug on it. Even the, the chart art planet um, Jupiter would have some effect on it because it's tremendous. So we see here Jupiter would, would interact as well. It's pretty close. It's, Jupiter is probably a small star that just couldn't really get much light out, but it, it emits more light than it, it, than it reflects. Now oh, here's Pluto's orbit and the, the rest of the planets, okay? Now, what we get into the ecliptic plane is this imaginary line from the center of the Earth to the center of the sun. And this is the ecliptic plane. So the Earth is tilted on its axis by 23.4 degrees, and that's good that it is tilted because it, it helps us to have life on the Earth. Without the tilt, we would have some problems. Okay? There'd be parts of the Earth would be perpetually dark, and they'd be just ice, pure ice. Other parts would be perpetually hot. So this uh, this gives us uh, the, the seasons that we have. Okay, now we have the North and the South Pole. We always draw it uh, like this on on uh, various maps. I guess people in Australia get tired of it being down under. As it's called, but uh, that's that's how we see the rotation of the Earth. Now the Earth is what has what we call an elliptical orbit. It's not exactly circular. And, and January the third, uh, this varies back and forth by about a half a day, maybe a day back and forth. But it's around January the third. Typically, that's when it'll be. Uh, I don't know how leap year affects this. I think it does skew it just a little bit. But uh, we have the Earth is closest to the sun at that point, and it's 147,300,000 kilometers from the sun. On July the 4th, it's 152,100,000 kilometers from the sun. That's called aphelion. And that's the furthest distance away. Perihelion is the closest, January the 3rd. And this is roughly a half a year, uh, almost exactly a half a year in time. If you divide 365 up by two, you'd get, and that would be pretty close to the number of days between here and here. Now then, here's the thing. We, we set forth earlier that the flood began in uh, July and continued for 150 days about right over in here somewhere. And at this point, and the sun pulled away the planet. I believe, of course, at this point, if it didn't pull it away by perihelion, if it, if it, if it was still circling the Earth after perihelion, it would be a permanent satellite for the Earth. So it had to occur before that time. That would be 150 days would give it time to pull it away. Okay. Now this is June solstice. We'll talk about the equinox and solstice. Equinox is when we have the uh, we have the uh, equal time for the sun, uh, daylight, night, nighttime. And so that's your equinox. Your solstice is when the Earth is tilted on its axis, and uh, so we get the tilt. And the solstice in June is where we have the longest day. That's the northern hemisphere, of course. And uh, and we get the shortest amount of daylight on December the 21st, 22nd, June the 21st, 22nd, June solstice. Okay. The slides are viewed from the standpoint of the northern hemisphere. Keep that in mind. Seasons are from the northern hemisphere, and, uh, and to relate these slides to the southern hemisphere, you should reverse the seasons. So if we go back. We would have uh, your seasons. Let me go back and maybe that's from here. Right here, this next slide. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, when they're having spring, the southern hemisphere is having autumn that time they're, they're just opposite when they're having winter in the northern we're having northern hemisphere they're having summer in the southern hemisphere 
So, so that it's just backwards to us. All right. Now, we won't get into the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, but these uh, have some uh, halves of points as well, but we'll not take the time to worry about them. Now, the Arctic Circle, above the Arctic Circle at uh, at the winter and the equinox, uh, what you'll get is you'll get at December solstice, for example, you'll get total darkness above the Arctic Circle in uh, in this time, and uh, and uh, in the uh, June solstice, you get total darkness uh, below the Antarctic Circle. And that's a, a circle there where it'll be total darkness during that on that day in that whole region, no light. I was lecturing in in Russia, in northern Russia, to Yaroslavl, and I saw the sun come up about 10.30 in the morning, go down about 1.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> and it was pretty, uh, it's pretty dark the rest of the day. And so uh, you can see that, and you can see that and the sun came up in the southeast rather than the east, and went down in the southwest. Yeah. Mercury and the moon's topography. Undoubtedly, there's some kind of terminal cataclysmic bombardment of the moon, according to this. This is Burgess. Uh, the question is whether it occurred simultaneously with bombardment of Mars or one, of, or, or one on Mercury, of Mercury, which formed the Colaris Basin. Mercury and the moon went through a stage of crustal genesis, followed by the formation of large impact basins that were later filled with extensive lava flows. Okay. My my model has this all occurring at the same time, okay? Particularly Mercury and the, and the moon. Now, what happened to Mars? It may have been that Mars interacted with Mercury, and then uh, caused Mercury to come into orbit around the Earth, and uh, this could have occurred at the same time. That's entirely possible. Couldn't we'll, we'll rule that out at all. Slade and colleagues think it most likely that extensive ice fields could be buried several meters deep beneath Mercury's soil. So they're claiming that there's evidence that there may be ice underneath the soil in Mercury. Temperatures would be permanently cold there, loss of water and molecules would be inhibited, and of course the soil would be hidden, have hidden the ice from Mariner's cameras while allowing penetration of the radar waves. So radar apparently showed there was something there. It appeared to maybe ice underneath it. Now, if this ice impacted mercury during the flood, uh, as the ice particles hit the ice chunks, hit the surface and embedded themselves in the layers, then this, of course, would, uh, would be explainable with what we see here. Our new images prove, according to Harmon, and this, all of this is in the book, prove the connection between these sources are between the radar anomalies and polar craters and provide strong support for the notion that the radar bright material is concentrated as permanent in permanently shaded crater floors. We're going to see a picture of this in just a minute. The most plausible model still seems to be one that shaded crater floors act as cold traps for water ice. Big deposits which provide a low loss medium for advanced volume backscatter radio waves. So the radio waves come back and are scattered. Conclusive proof of the existence of polar ice would require spacecraft missions equipped with ultraviolet or neutron spectrometers and possibly sampling penetrators. You may have to sample it, causing some object to impact it. Uh, and uh, impact these areas like a little rocket go down. Permanent shadowing alone, according to Harmon, may not guarantee temperatures low enough to sustain ice. Remember, they think these planets are billions of years old, of course, and uh, they can't sustain ice for that long. Now, what happens? Water ice, they say, of course, is likely to be stable at the temperatures of the polar regions of Mercury on time scales longer than several hundred million years. So that's what they're claiming. Now, what about comets? Could comets give us the ice? Well, they're rich in ice, water, so in ice, of course, 
but the impact on mercury at very high rates of speed, uh, sometimes surpassing 100 kilometers per second. So the energetic, so energetic is the impact collision, explosion, that it is not only removes all the water in the impactor, because that kinetic energy is converted into heat and vaporizes the water. And if you had even zero degrees Kelvin ice, uh, minus 273 degrees Celsius, 476 degrees negative Fahrenheit, and that neighborhood that is, uh, you would still vaporize the water. It only it removes all the water in the impactor, but a, but a fair amount of the surface of mercury along with it. So you can't argue that this was formed by craters, formed by during by comets. Comets would wouldn't do it because they would vaporize. They wouldn't stay. Here's the craters on Mercury near the poles, the polar craters. There's a bunch of craters here. It's very interesting. Now let's see what they have. They have this color. The red regions are perpetually shaded regions where there's no sunlight to get to them. And the yellow is uh, in this model and their system is ice. And so these are ice particles. This is ice, the yellow is ice and the Red is shaded areas where it's perpetually shaded. Here's just showing you the ice in the craters on Mercury. So there's a fair amount of ice there. And of course, Mercury is real, real close to the sun. It gets very hot on the surface of Mercury. Of course, the region is perpetually shaded, wouldn't get any sunlight. In the atmosphere. The prior two slides show where ice has recently, that is November 2012, been discovered on the planet Mercury. Now, my model predicted this several years ago before they discovered it. The model uh, did predict it. There are other predictions that I have. Uh, the next slide will show cracks in the surface of Mercury. We have cracks in the surface of Mercury, and this, these are pictures of it. And these are fault lines, what we'd say, fault lines. Some scientists have theorized that Earth once nearly captured the planet Venus. And it's, it's possible they have the wrong planet mine. It's possible that the Earth nearly captured Mercury. And here's uh, page 120 of Intranet, and Bibbering and Blanc discuss this theory. Now, these same sources, internet, Bibbering, and Block state this indicates that the rotation of Venus, like that of Mercury, has been braked during the course of the planet's evolution. Something braked it or slowed it down. Something happened to it. Of course, my model shows how it was braked, and my model would have braked. Uh, Venus and Mercury might have interacted with the gravity of Venus, aiding the sun to capture Mercury by the slingshot effect. This is an effect used by NASA in their deep space probes. They, they run it out around the moon, circle it around Venus, or usually Venus, and uh, cycle it back out into space again. And uh, they equips run it around two or three times, and each time it'll gain more energy due to the, the rotational effect, uh, the transfer of angular momentum uh, from Venus. Now, what happens here is Mercury comes in and Venus pulls it. Venus is in the position when uh, the Earth is near perihelion, just before perihelion, it's lined up with the Sun, between the Earth and, and the Sun. And so its gravity then pulls, Mercury helps the Sun pull Mercury away from this Earth, end the, ending the flood creating this rotation as it goes around Venus, close to Venus, transferring angular momentum, making Venus turn retrograde. I think Venus was probably locked in sync and it kept the same side, like the moon does. The moon keeps the same side to the Earth at all times. And uh, so uh, Venus probably had that same phenomena 
whenever it uh, was circling the sun. Now, up here, Mercury's interaction with Venus. Let's go further. Extrapolating from the results of the first mapping cycle, project scientists expect that all of Venus has only about a thousand craters larger than a few kilometers. So it doesn't have that many craters. So it's very interesting. Why wouldn't it have more craters? It doesn't have the craters because it hasn't interacted with another planet except this one time interacting with Mercury. Within 30 degrees of the equator, craters that lie on a focus of a large parabolic shaped dark markings. Now this would fit the model and the remnants of the ring still left uh, impacting uh, Venus. 500 to 1,000 kilometers long, these dark markings are. And it's kind of like our our uh, three rings of of uh, craters on the Earth itself as we had the three passes. The dark parabolas lie parallel to each other and are open toward due west. Again, I haven't modeled this mathematically to uh, see how that would work. Uh, just looking at it, it fits pretty well. Since Venus interacted with Mercury after the 150 days of winters of heaven, we would not expect Venus to have very many craters because the rings of Mercury were mostly depleted at that time. We would expect Venus to have a gravitational anomaly and Mercury to have two gravitational anomalies, one when it interacted with the Earth and one when it interacted with Venus. And exactly that's what we see. We have two gravitational anomalies on, on uh, Mercury. And uh, I think they need to look for one on, on Venus. The problem with Venus, it's, its atmosphere is so hot, it's hard to probe it. Uh, they can only probe it with, with radar waves, uh, light waves. Uh, it just won't come back with lasers. Have a problem with that. Oh, here's some of the craters, and that's been found with uh, high definition radar. This is our lesson for tonight. We'll continue with this study next week.